Father, the psalmist says in Psalm 119, verse 105, that your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. Lighten our way, Father, and illumine our paths by your word this morning. Help us to see you clearly and the fruit that you are bringing forth in our lives today and in the days ahead. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning, IAC. My name is Jeremy. I am one of the priests here at IAC, uh, assisting priest, and it's a pleasure to be able to bring a word to you here this morning. It has been a while since I have been able to preach, so glad to be here. Uh, For those of you who were able to come out and do the run with Rwanda yesterday, how are you doing today? There you go. I was waiting for it because someone, they did it in the first service, so. But how are you doing today? How are you feeling? Any soreness? Any stiff muscles? You know, I know I was feeling some soreness after the run. Uh, I I ran really hard yesterday, as possibly as as fast as I could, because I've been training uh, to increase my endurance and my stamina, my speed, so I can be prepared to enter the Army chaplaincy here next month. Um, I know that I didn't run as hard as many of you, though, so great job. (laughs) But you know, uh, uh, I did... Then I have a question for you here. And the next question is going to sound kind of like a random question, but it's really not. It's got a purpose, okay? But did you know that bananas, bananas are a great way to reduce mon- muscle fatigue and soreness after a run like 5K? Did you know that? It's pretty funny. Bananas, like most fruit, are a, good, a great food to eat after a workout because they can reduce inflammation and replenish muscle glycogen stores ultimately uh, promoting quicker recovery. So if you get nothing else out of this sermon today, nothing else, I encourage you to go home and eat some bananas, all right? (laughs) But this leads me to the topic of our sermon series that we have been looking at over the past few weeks. Uh, We've been exploring the fruit of the Spirit found in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Now, as I mentioned above, fruit is is good for muscle recovery, but what else is fruit good for? What is its purpose other than to give us nutrition? According to our old trusty friend, Wikipedia, yeah, fruits are, are, by, are the means by which flowering plants disseminate their seeds. The fruit, fruit's flesh in which the seeds are somehow encased, encased protects the seeds from drying out. And when it is eaten, these seeds can then be more easily disseminated with the intention of finding fertile ground where new plants can be produced. Fruit then helps the plant to continue to reproduce. Now similarly, when I think about the fruits of the Spirit, these are a means by which the Holy Spirit, who lives in us, produces the life-giving virtues of God in our lives. At first, when we are a newbie or a young Christian, uh, the fruit might be small and only a few. But as we grow and as we mature, uh, with time and age and experience, these fruits get bigger. They begin to multiply. The more we walk in step with the Spirit of God, the more these fruits are manifested or harvested in our lives. It is the life-giving Spirit who produces his life-giving fruit in our lives in order that we might be life-giving Christians in and to the world around us. Two weeks ago, Pastor Scott helped us understand the bedrock of all of these fruits of the Spirit, right? He said, ultimately, love is the foundation from which every one of these fruits is built upon. God's love for us and our love for one another. Last week, Pastor Christie explored the fruit of joy and how joy is not found in our circumstances of life, but in God himself. God is our joy. Now this week, we take a deeper look, a deeper dive into faithfulness and gentleness. In the Bible, the word faith is used about 30 times in the Old Testament and over 500 times in the New. To have faith means that one has a conviction of the truth of God and a trust in Him, as well as a true commitment of self to God and an unwavering trust in His promises. 
That is, they have a faith and a trust that God is who he says he is, that Christ is who he says he is, and that we are who God says we are in relation to him and what he has done for us through Christ. You know, one only needs to look and read Hebrews 11 to see this faith in action. So we know from the New Testament that Jesus desired to build up the faith of his disciples in order that they would have this unwavering trust in him in order to go out and to minister and live out their lives boldly for him. And we also know that a lack of faith, a lack of faith in God is the supreme evil mentioned in the Bible. And a lack of faith leads to all types of self-centered sin in the world. You see, faith leads us leads to life in God, and a lack of faith leads to death and away from God. And this faith doesn't originate in us outside of God, too. It is a gift of God to all who would believe in him, as Paul reminds us in Ephesians 2.8. For by the grace of God you have been saved, through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is a gift of God. The writer of Hebrews says in chapter 12 that Jesus is the author and perfecter the author and perfecter of our faith. Praise be to God. It is not based on me or my ability or my thinking or what I know, but Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith. But the word faithfulness here, the the word faithfulness that we have here in Galatians, this means something a little bit more. When the Spirit takes up residence in our lives and the fruit of that residence begins to show forth to us and to others, having faithfulness means that we are dependable in fulfilling our responsibilities and carrying out our word to God and to others. Let me say that one more time. Having faithfulness means that we are dependable in fulfilling our responsibilities and in carrying out our word to God and to others. You see, we don't purposefully go back on those things, on our responsibilities and our word. The Holman Bible Dictionary defines faithfulness as being steadfast, dedicated, dependable, and trustworthy, or worthy of trust. So as an example, most of us have taken vows in some shape or form in our lives, right? We took uh, vows at our baptism if we've been baptized, or we reaffirmed those vows when we were confirmed, or for those who have been married, you've taken marriage vows. In these vows, we make promises to God and to others. We have a responsibility to keep these vows, to follow and love God with our whole selves, and to love others as Christ has loved us. And you see, God and others who depend on us, or God and others, they depend on us to keep these vows. Just imagine if we were married and we were not, not dependable in keeping our marriage vows. What kind of marriage would that be? When we keep these vows, we are walking out of faithfulness. If we are considered faithful by others, they trust us. They can depend on us to do what we say we will do. And when we fail, when we fail to follow through, people come to see us as untrustworthy. Now Paul is telling us here in this text that the Holy Spirit enables us as Christians, through the Spirit, enables us to fulfill our responsibilities, to do those things that we've been tasked to do, and to keep our word to God and to others. And think about it. I mean, what is the reason for this faithfulness? What is the reason? We are called to be faithful because God is faithful to us. He is trustworthy, dependable. He is steadfast in who he is and what he says he will do. Faithfulness is what, uh, as with all of these fruits of the Spirit, faithfulness is firmly rooted in who God is. And when the Spirit lives in us and moves within us, it's his character ultimately showing itself in us. His character showing himself in us. Because we are attached to the vine, faithfulness flows from God into and through us. And ultimately, when we are faithful, God is glorified. Of course, we will fail. We will fail because of sin, because of the flesh, 
because of our own lack of faithfulness, our own desires to go our own way. But being faithful doesn't mean that we won't fail. It means that when we do fail, we seek forgiveness, and by God's grace, we continue to walk in step with His Spirit despite those failures. so that his fruit can continue to be harvested in our lives. The good news is, friends, the good news here is that God's faithfulness remains even when we fail time and time again. His faithfulness remains. Hallelujah. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. His faithfulness remains. So what have we promised to do? What responsibilities do we have to fulfill? And what do others depend on us to do? Who trusts in us to be steadfast? In our homes with our family members? At our places of work with our coworkers? In our communities with our friends and neighbors? In our schools with our teachers and our colleagues or other students? Because we have the Spirit within us, let us be faithful, dependable, trustworthy to our responsibilities and in keeping our word. Now, for most of us, faithfulness, this is probably an easy fruit of the Spirit to both understand and manifest in our lives, maybe. Gentleness, on the other hand, it's a little trickier, at least for me. Here, and here's my confession. You know, I realized recently, and I know the bishop's sitting here, so maybe he can just plug his ears and not, not listen, but <laughs> here's my confession. I realized recently that I am not a gentle person. Not in a way that it's used here anyway. You know, last Lent I sent out and I failed to grow in this area. It was my hope that in those 40 days I would come to a deeper understanding of what it meant to be gentle and then to implement that in my life. Disciplining this fleshly body of ours is so, so, so hard. But God is faithful, amen? So what is gentleness then? The word for gentleness in the Bible isn't very common, but where it is found, it's used for Jesus and for God. It is a word like faithfulness that derives from the character of God, for God is truly gentle. Just as Pastor Christie shared with us a moment ago, God is truly gentle. Though I, I think for many of us, though, we don't tend to think of God as gentle. We tend to think of him more as judgmental and harsh. Gentleness can mean a gentleness of spirit. It can mean a meekness. And for meekness, I'm, I mean uh, something I heard here that I don't have time to play out here, but maybe you, you do. Strength, strength for, um, meekness can mean a strength that accommodates another's weakness. Strength that accommodates another weakness. Coming alongside them and helping them in their weakness. It could also mean a mildness or a humility. It does not mean weakness, or, or being a pushover, or being a doormat. There's certain things that we want to make sure that we just don't allow happen, like spiritual, emotional, physical, sexual abuse. That's not what we're meaning here. According to one commentator, the basic idea behind gentleness is real strength under control. Another commentary says, uh, it defines it really well. It says, uh, gentleness denotes the humble, the humble and gentle attitude which expresses itself in particular in a patient submissiveness to offense. In a patient submissiveness to offense. It is free from malice and desire for revenge. It is control, controlled strength, the ability to bear reproaches and slights without bitterness and resentment. The ability to provide a soothing influence on someone who is in a state of anger or bitterness or resentment. It is a word that indicates an obedient submissiveness to God and to His will with an unwavering faith and an enduring patience 
displaying itself in a gentle attitude and kind acts towards others. This often happens in the face of opposition, in the face of adversity. It is the opposite of arrogance, and it stands in contrast to the term of orge. Orge meaning wrath or anger, and that's a state of mind or a state of being where you're just full of wrath and anger. It denotes the humble and gentle attitude which expresses itself in particular in a patient submissiveness to offense. To offense. That's the key there, patient submissiveness to offense, a freedom from malice and desire for revenge, a mildness, patient trust in the midst of difficult circumstances. Now, I know that was a long quote, but man, it just like captures everything this word can possibly mean. And do you see why I can say that I'm not a very gentle person? Because I'm none of those things, or I don't live them very well. I don't have a patient submissiveness to offense. No, I get angry. I let the offense stew inwardly until I want to lash out. I don't actually lash out. When things don't go the way I want them to go, my heart gets bitter and I resent my wife, my children, my family, my pastor, my bishop, my friends, my boss, my coworkers. I resent even God, the lover of my soul. While I would never outwardly display malice towards anyone or seek revenge inwardly, my heart and my thoughts, they're telling me I'm better than them. I'm more experienced than them. I know what I'm talking about more than them. No, I deserve and am entitled to get my way more than them. And then I get angry. I get bitter towards them. When I experience adversity, I am full of orge, wrath, and anger, and I don't act very kindly, you know, mostly in my thoughts, sometimes in my words and actions. You see, when I'm in this state of being, I don't have a patient trust, and and I'm not submissive to the will of God. I'm trying to go my way. I'm walking out of the flesh, moving away from the Lord. Can you relate? But you see, here's the amazing thing again. Even in our shortcomings, through his grace, God's grace and mercy, and by the righteousness of Christ, God is gentle towards us. He is patient towards us. He is free from malice and revenge. He, through the Spirit, has a soothing influence on us in that state of wrath and anger, in our state of wrath and anger, not his, He does not lose his temper. He does not fly off his handle when we mess up. He has a strength under control. You see, God acts kindly towards us. There is no ill will. God is not in a state of wrath and anger. God is a God who is with us. He is for us. He loves us. He delights in us. He is good. Is this the gentle God that we know? Is this the gentle God that we believe in? So how do we respond to life circumstances when things don't go our way? How do we respond when the spouse, when my spouse says no to this great idea I just had? How do we respond when we get passed over for promotion or or the major project that goes to the colleague? How do we respond when the candidate of the other party gets elected? I mean, how do we respond when life doesn't go our way? I think it's a good indicator, and how we answer that is if we have gentleness or not. And every opportunity that we have is a chance for the Spirit within us to cause us to respond from a place of gentleness, with a patient submissiveness. Every adverse experience is a chance for the Holy Spirit to condition us more and more into His gentle way. We embrace the present with all of its varied experiences, with joy, the joy of the Lord, 
and not bitterness and malice, knowing that God is in control and that He is the one who is leading us onward. Probably the best illustration of gentleness that I've come across is, is this. It's, it's the strength of a horse under the control of a bridle and bit. When a horse is well-trained or broke, as they say, uh, the horse no longer uses their strength and power to go their own way, but they follow the commands and directions of the rider. They are no longer some wild stallion, but they're some easygoing trail horse that we can trust to put our three-year-old daughter on or three-year-old son. Similarly, as, as the Spirit moves in our lives, conditioning and training us to become broke for the Lord, we will manifest in our lives more fully a true spirit of gentleness towards God and towards others and even towards ourselves. We will be able to show goodness and kindness, love and grace to everyone, regardless if things go the way that we would have them go or not. In fact, in gentleness, with a patient submissiveness, we no longer seek our way, but the way of others first. The fruits of faithfulness and gentleness, church, these are beautiful and glorious gifts from God. They are a goodness full of sweet and juicy flavor. And when these fruits are manifested and harvested in our lives, we not only have life, but we have it abundantly. As we become more firmly rooted in God's streams of living water, abundant fruit is produced in every season of our lives. We prosper. For remember, what is fruit for? but to bear seeds and multiply and to give life. And this spiritual fruit comes from life. God is the originator of all life. It begets life in us and it it makes the fruit in us to have that abundant life over and over and over again. This is a good and beautiful thing. What a glorious process the Lord of life has us in. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we stand here in your love, thankful for you and for your gentleness and your patience and your goodness and your faithfulness towards us. Father, we pray that you would, we give you thanks too for the spirit that is within us and as we begin to uh, just continue to walk in that spirit, to, to, to deepen our walk in that spirit, Lord, that the fruits of your spirit would manifest themselves and be harvested in our lives more and more each and every day. May they multiply. May they bear fruit. May we desire these fruits and the life that they bring above all else. Lord, thank you for your love for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.